Hello guys, welcome to Buddy Academy and this is me Uma here and I'm back with newer concept in biology today. Before we move to our class, it's tip time and here we go. Tip number 4. Time will kill your marks. So start managing your time from today so that you can manage your time effectively during your examination. So what are we going to discuss today? We are going to discuss the last topic of principles of inheritance and variation that is genetic disorder and we are also going to begin a new concept, new chapter, molecular are basis of inheritance. We have already discussed about the weightage of this lesson and you people know the importance. So study everything without eliminating any concepts. So let us move on to our class. Come on. So we are going to begin with genetic disorder and they are classified into two categories Mendelian disorder and chromosomal disorder. So Mendelian disorder show Mendelian pattern of inheritance and there are two types one is autosomal and allosomal. Allosomal is sex link where the disease is linked with the sex chromosome. Again there are two types which will fall under these two categories. One is the gene will be dominant either the gene will be recessive it is either autosomal dominant autosomal recessive similarly allosomal dominant and allosomal recessive the second category is chromosomal disorder where there will be a defect in the chromosome either there will be a change in structure or there will be change in number which will be classified under ploidy and i'll be explaining you that so change in structure there are deletion duplication inversion and translocation again about which we will be discussing. So what is color blindness? So first thing we are going to study about Mendelian disorder and that under that first disorder is color blindness. So color blindness is nothing but the person will be unable to differentiate between red and green color. So again it is a sex linked recessive disorder and predominantly seen in male and only 0.4% of females are affected. So where is this defect? Uh, defective gene located it is located in the X chromosome so the red green color blindness are on the X chromosome so you can tell it as X linked recessive disorder so yes as I said this is the cross for your color blindness so when women is a carrier and man is normal generally we said it is a recessive disorder so unless both are XC and XC the female will not be affected when female will be affected when mother is acting as a carrier and father is colorblind there are chances of female being colorblind so yes this is the cross for that and you can see one female will have possibility to become a carrier and one male son will have the male will be having a possibility to get affected or to become colorblind so this is the possibility of a daughter becoming colorblind if only here uh, there will not be affected mother it is a carrier mother so yes if a father is colorblind and mother is carrier what will happen the colorblind son colorblind daughter normal son and carrier daughter when will the female or daughter will get affected only when the mother is carrier and the father is affected so second disorder is hemophilia which is also called as royal bleeders disease since it was discovered in Queen Victoria. So here some clotting factors are absent so that the blood won't clot and it will be goes on it will be going on flowing so that what will happen the wound won't clot and they require immediate attention or medication in order to make the clot clotted wound. So yes Queen Victoria passed hemophilia on to some of her descendants so it is also called as royal bleeders disease. So this is also an X link recessive disorder and the defective gene is located in the X chromosome. There are two types of hemophilia one is hemophilia A and the other one is hemophilia B. So here what is defective is clotting factor A and here clotting factor 9 is defective so A 8 and B 9. So yes this is the cross for hemophilia and you can see the carrier female and a normal male. So we know that it is an X linked recessive disorder. So you can see the small H will indicate the defective or hemophilic gene and capital H is normal gene here and you can see the carrier female and normal male again this cross is also similar to color blindness. The same thing will also be applied here. So you can see more possibilities in male than female. When will a female become hemophilic that is when her mother is a carrier and father is already hemophilic or affected with 
hemophilia so yes as i said the possibility of a female becoming hemophilic is extremely rare because mother of such a female has to be at least carrier and father should be hemophilic so as i said it is given here and if you could recall from previous class uh, we studied about pedigree analysis there we said this will have a crisscross pattern of inheritance so female will generally act as a carrier again she will be passing it to on her son then that defective gene can also go to the daughter and from the father and she can act as carrier again it can be passed on to son in that way it will be inherited crisscross manner so next there is also one more type of hemophilia which is hemophilia c but this is an autosomal recessive disorder not sex link here clot clotting factor 11 is absent so hemophilia c is not an x link it is an autosomal recessive disorder where clotting factor 11 is absent so next will be sickle cell anemia so Sickle cell anemia is again autosomal recessive genetic disorder. So we studied about hemophilia color blindness which are X linked. Now we are going to study about autosomal link. So this is also an autosomal recessive disorder where the RBCs are in sickle shaped under hypoxia condition. So normal heart, so these structures are different from normal RBC. You can see they are in sickle shape and they will have a reduced oxygen carrying capacity and because of that there will be hypoxia condition and they will become sickle shape and they, they can block the clump and clog the small blood vessels. So it is an autosomal linked recessive trait and it is controlled by two genes that is a single pair of allele only it is controlled by HBA and HBS again it is a recessive one A is a normal one and H is the defective gene here. So if a person is having both HBS and HBS he will be having sickle cell anemia. So yes, the defect is caused due to substitution of glutamic acid by valine at the 6th position of beta globin chain of an hemoglobin molecule. So you can see this is a substitution reaction happening here due to defect in the mRNA itself. So here you can see this is CTG and GAG. It is coding for glutamic acid. Instead of CTG, CAC is present in that gene and what is happening that DNA strand so that it is coding for GUG. You can see how a small defect in that particular gene is affecting the entire phenotype of that organism and this is an example for that. So if it is GUG, so what is going to happen? It is going to code for valine. So what is going to be the structure of your RBC? It is going to be sickle in shape. So next is phenylketonuria. Again, it is an autosomal recessive trait. If you could remember, we have also discussed about the symptoms of phenylketonuria in the previous class itself. Again, it is an inborn error of amino acid metabolism due to a defect in the phenylalanine hydroxylase gene. Generally, this phenylalanine hydroxylase gene will code for the hepatic enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase. So if this enzyme is absent, what will happen? Phenylalanine and its components. So phenylalanine is generally converted into tyrosine during its metabolism. So if it is absent, what will happen? This phenylalanine will not be converted to tyrosine and it will be converted into phenyl products. So it will be, it can be converted into phenyl pyruvate and phenyl lactate and some other derivative. So where will it ultimately accumulate is? It will accumulate in the brain. So next defect will be thalassemia. Normally hemoglobin is composed of four polypeptide chain that is two alpha and two beta. So it is an heterotetramer. So again the same defect like sickle cell anemia but not similar to sickle cell anemia. Again what will happen is the person will be affected by severe anemia like in sickle cell anemia. But here there is a defect in both alpha and beta globin chain either alpha or beta globin chain because of the defect in gene. So they have defect in alpha globin chain. It is called as alpha thalassemia. If they have defect in beta globin chain, it is called as beta thalassemia. So what will happen? There will be production of abnormal hemoglobin molecule. So what will it result? It will result in anemia again. So it is an autosomal linked recessive blood disease transmitted from the parent to offspring when both the parents are unaffected carrier for the gene. So the defect could be either due to mutation or deletion which ultimately results in reduced rate of synthesis of globin chain either alpha or beta. So as I said in alpha thalassemia alpha globin chain will be 
defective or affected whereas in beta thalassemia beta globin chain is affected. So alpha thalassemia is generally controlled by two genes that is linked genes HPA1 and A2 which is located on chromosome number 16. So whereas beta globin chain is generally com controlled only by one gene which is nothing but gene HPV which is located on the chromosome number 11. So next will be chromosomal disorders. The chromosomal disorders are caused due to absence or exist or abnormal arrangement of one or more chromosome. So failure of segregation of chromatid during cell division results in gain or loss of chromosome. So ploidy again there are two types of ploidy one is euploidy and aneuploidy. So you can just remember it here euploidy is a set and aneuploidy is just number. In aneuploidy again you have two categories one is hypoploidy and the other one is hyperploidy. You can just remember it like this hypoploidy minus and hyperploidy plus plus 1 or 2 or this is minus 1 or 2. Here in euploidy the complete set of chromosome will vary. So again here they have monoploidy that is the organism will contain one set of chromosome diploidy 2n and polyploidy more than 2n in that auto polyploidy and allopolyploidy. So again hypopolyploidy contain monosomy and nullisomy minus 1 and minus 2 chromosome again here trisomy and tetrasomy plus 1 and plus 2 chromosome. So these are the defects that are present. So first thing is deletion. So deletion of one base what will it do? It will change the entire frame shape. For example, you know genetic code will be uh, read in sequence of 3-3. Three, three. So when this lesson is proceeding in the next lesson we will be discussing that. At that time you will understand this more. So it will be read as TAA CTG. So now how it will be read? It will be read as TAA CGC and now the entire frame shift will change. Similarly inversion a base pair will be inverted you can see here. So at that time also what will happen the entire reading of base pair will change and then insertion inserting of a base same thing the entire frame shift will change and this is translocation which is an important thing. So this translocation only causes chronic myeloid leukemia that is blood cancer. So a segment of chromosome will be attached to some other chromosome like it will be exchanged. For example, you can see this segment of chromosome number 4 is seen in chromosome number 20 and vice versa. So again duplication is also present where one more repetition of that particular gene will be happening. So duplication, deletion, inversion and translocation. So failure of cytokinesis after telophase stage of cell division will result in an whole set of chromosome in an organism that is will result in an increase of whole set of chromosome in an organism and this is called as polyploidy and where this polyploidy is seen it is often seen in plants and you know human beings there are 46 chromosome that is 23 pairs whereas 22 pairs are autosome and one pair is sex chromosome. So here some are, so there are some defects that are caused due to ploidy that is change in chromosome number in human beings and one among that is Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, Klenfilter syndrome and which we will be discussing. Down syndrome like it is the cause of trisomy in 21. So at the place of chromosome number 21 you can see there are not a pair there are three chromosomes you can see this right. So that results in Down syndrome. So what will be the symptom? So it was first discovered and described by Langton Down in the year 1866. The individual will be short straighted with small round head, furrowed tongue and partially open mouth. Palm is broad with characteristic palm crease and mental development will be retarded in that particular person or infant. So next will be Klenfilter syndrome. Klenfilter syndrome is nothing but it is a type of presence of 47 chromosome. Here there is no defect in the autosome. Here there is a defect in the sex chromosome. They will have an extra X chromosome. So generally male will have sex chromosome as XY. In Klenfilter syndrome they will have it as XXY. So such an individual will have masculine development but also show female characters. So one important characters of that is gynecomastia which is nothing but development of breasts in male. So this character is very important you should remember this gynecomastia and those individuals are generally sterile. You can see gynecomastia and normal male breasts and this is presence of an extra X chromosome. So this is 
the clan filter syndrome man and the features of that man. So next, non-disjunction of sex chromosomes that is their failure of separation during cytokinesis will result in these kind of conditions. Sometimes what will happen? Two X chromosome will be present in one egg and there will not be any X chromosome present and this is where it is resulting in Klenfelter syndrome and Turner syndrome. Turner syndrome is seen in female where the female is having only 45 chromosome that is instead of 2 X chromosome the female will have only one X chromosome and that is also denoted as XO. So such females are sterile as ovaries are rudimentary besides other features including lack of secondary sexual character. They will also lack secondary sexual character and they are also sterile and this is a Turner syndrome female. So next we will start with a new chapter molecular basis of inheritance. So what are factors? So we discussed in the previous chapter that at the time of Mendel the nature of those factors regulating the pattern of inheritance was not clear. Mendel said we know those are genes but imagine at those times they were discussing what were factors. So factors inheriting was not clear and they after naming it as gene they wanted to go in depth to see what is the structure of gene and what is the molecular level of that particular gene. What is that gene made up of? Then over next 100 years the nature of genetic material was investigated culminating in the realization that DNA is the genetic material at least for majority of the organisms. So can you recall about biomolecules? What are nucleic acids? Yes. Do two nucleic acids that are present in the living system are DNA and RNA that is deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid. So here DNA will act as genetic material in most of the organism. However, ribonucleic acid that is RNA will also act as genetic material in some of the viruses. Mostly they function as messenger. Also they do other roles which we will be discussing in this chapter. So it also functions as adapter, structural and some cases catalytic molecule that is an enzyme. So we are now going to discuss about the structure of DNA. So DNA is a long polymer of deoxyribonucleotide. DNA is usually defined as number of nucleotides present in it. So it is also a characteristic feature of every organism. For example, haploid content of human DNA that is half a content. 23 chromosome number is 23 it is 3.3 into 10 power 9 base pair similarly in E. coli it is 4.6 into 10 power 6 base pair. So now we are going to see the structure of nucleic acid what is generally nucleic acid made up of it is made up of nucleotides we said it is a polynucleotide right DNA is a polynucleotide and what is it made up of it is made up of nucleoside and phosphoric acid. Again nucleoside is made up of two things nitrogenous base and a sugar. So these nitrogenous bases are classified into purines and pyrimidines. So purines under purines we will have adenine and guanine. Under pyrimidines we will have three things that is cytosine, uracil and thymine. So sugar there are pentose sugar. So all are pentose sugar and one is ribose whereas the other one is deoxyribose. So this is the pentose sugar you can see. This one is ribose which is present in RNA and this is deoxyribose which is present in DNA that is why it is ribonucleic acid and this is deoxyribonucleic acid. You should remember this structure very well because at the second position you can see here OH group is present and here no oxygen is present and only H is present. This is an important thing to remember because this is an very important property of DNA when discussing about the property I will remember it to you again. So nitrogenous bases as we said there are two one is purine and the other one is pyrimidine. Pyrimidine molecules contain pyrimidine ring you can see cytosine, uracil and thiamine. This uracil is present only in RNA whereas in DNA thiamine is present. You should also see this structure this place of uracil and this place of thymine because because of this also DNA is stable and again when discussing about the property of genetic material this thing will be coming. So next again purine will contain one pyrimidine ring and an imidazole ring adenine and guanine are two purines. So again what are the three parts of nucleotide a nitrogenous base a pentose sugar and an phosphate group. 
So, next we will be discussing about the formation of polynucleotide and how a nucleotide is formed. So, let us start from the pairing of that is bond formation of the nitrogenous base and the sugar. So, this one is purine you can see and this one is a pyrimidine adenine and cytosine. So, how this is going to form a bond with the sugar is here the ninth position nitrogen will share a bond with the first, car first carbon that is present in the sugar. So, now this bond is called as glycosidic bond or glycosidic linkage and this is called as 1 comma 9 N glycosidic linkage. So, similarly the first carbon will share up of sugar will share a bonding with the pyrimidine also but here which nitrogen is sharing a bond it is first nitrogen. So, it is 1 comma 1 similarly N glycosidic linkage. So, yes again now we are going to see about the bond about the bonding between the sugar and the phosphate group that is phosphoric acid. So, the fifth carbon that is present in the sugar will share a bond with the phosphate. Similarly, this bond is called as an ester bond phosphoester bond and when you see when it is going to be linked just see carefully now it is going to form a bond with the third carbon that is here it, there will be OH and it is going to share a bond with this. So, yes and this is that O. It is linked with this. So, this is called as phosphodiester linkage and in this way so this is basically a dinucleotide and in this way many nucleotides are added and they form a polynucleotide. So, you can see the 3 dash N and 5 dash N here. So, one free hydroxyl group that is from third carbon will serve as the 3 dash N or the 3 dash hydroxyl N whereas one free phosphate deity will serve as the 5 dash phosphate N. It can also be given as the phosphate N and hydroxyl N. You have to know which is 5 dash N and which is 3 dash N. In order to remember that only I said about this 3 dash bonding of carbon. So, next will be the formation of double strand in DNA and you know DNA is a double helical structure. So, there how double helical structure is formed? It is formed between bonding of two base pairs. So, here which is going to pair with which is adenine is going to pair with thymine. So, purine and pyrimidine are generally going to form base pair. Here adenine is going to form a bond with thymine so that it is going to be attached with the help of two hydrogen bonds. I will just put draw it like this two hydrogen bonds whereas the other purine and pyrimidine guanine is going to form with a bond guanine is going to form a bond with cytosine with the help of three hydrogen bonds. In this way the double helical strand the two strands of DNA are held together. So, you can see this is the backbone that is phosphodiester bond and which bond helps in holding the two strands? It is the hydrogen bonding that is present in between purine and pyrimidine. Again, adenine and thymine will share two hydrogen bonds whereas guanine and cytosine will share three hydrogen bonds. So, yes, cytosine is common for both DNA and RNA whereas thymine is present only in DNA. Uracil is present in RNA in the place of thymine. So, as we have already discussed, hydroxyl of first pentose sugar through. So, nitrogenous base how it will be linked to a base that is sugar that is it will be linked to the hydroxyl of first pentose sugar through N glycosidic linkage to form a nucleoside. As we said nucleoside is a sugar plus a nitrogenous base whereas nucleotide is it will be along with the phosphoric acid. So, again two nucleotides are linked through 3 dash to 5 dash phosphodiester linkage to form a dinucleotide. Again nucleotides will be added in the same form and a polymer will be formed at the end that is called as a polynucleotide. So, again same thing is also given here what what bond is forming where. So, also in RNA uracil is found in place of thymine and this is very important for you to 
remember. So who discovered DNA? It was by Frederick Mischer in the year 1869 and he named it as nuclein. And then two people, James Watson and Francis Crick in 1953 proposed a model that is Watson and Crick model of DNA for which they were awarded even Nobel Prize. They, their study was based on the X-ray diffraction data which is produced by Wilkins and Franklin. Through that, they study the structure of DNA and they propose how a typical DNA will appear. Apart from that, Erwin Chargaff also play an important role in knowing or in explaining how the bases pair and what are the quantity of bases that are present in a DNA. So, base pairing confers a very unique property to the polynucleotide chain. So, this is the Watson and Crick structure of DNA. You can see one strand is running in the direction of 3 dash to 5 dash whereas other strand is running in the direction of 5 dash to 3 dash. So, the polarity of the strand is generally anti-parallel. So, two strands run in the anti-parallel direction and you can see this group is smaller whereas this is larger whereas the smaller one is the minor group and the larger one is the major group and one helix will have 10 base pair. So, one helix of DNA will generally have one base pair and the distance between each base pair is 3.4 amps strong. So, the distance of one helical turn that is one complete helix. So, I am talking about this part is 3.4 amps strong that is for 10 base pair. So, each is placed at a distance of 10 amps strong sorry totally for one entire helical turn it is 34 amps strong. So, again he also said that the diameter of helix will be 20 amps strong. So, yes, one chain has a polarity of 5 dash to 3 dash whereas the other has 3 dash to 5 dash. So, bases in a DNA are paired through hydrogen bonding and they also run in opposite direction. So, pure always purine comes opposite to a pyrimidine. So, why it is coming like that? In order to arrange. So, adenine forms two hydrogen bonds with thiamine from opposite strand and vice versa. So, two chains are coiled in a right handed fashion. So, the pitch of the helix is 3.4 nanometer. So, entire pitch, so they are talking about 34 Armstrong is 3.4 nanometer. And they are not talking about 3.4 Armstrong, the entire helical distance or the pitch generally is the height is 3.4 Armstrong and there are roughly 10 base pairs in each turn. Consequently, distance between a helix is approximately 0.34 nanometer which is nothing but 3.4 Armstrong. So, this is again the Chargaff's rule. What he said was the amount of adenine will be equal to the amount of thiamine, the amount of guanine will be equal to the amount of cytosine. So, what is he making here? The ratio of purine and pyrimidine will be equal to 1. So, indicated that the structure of DNA is symmetrical. So, the ratio of purine and pyrimidine will be equal to 1 that is Chargaff's rule. So, now we are going to calculate the number of base pairs in E. coli we are going to learn a formula. So, in E. coli the length of DNA is 1.36 millimeter can I calculate the number of base pairs that is present in an E. coli. So, total length of DNA is equal to total number of base pairs into distance between two consecutive base pairs. So, we know that Distance between two consecutive base pair and double helix is 0.34 into 10 power minus 9 meter. So, with that we are just considering this the total number of base pairs are as x and we are going to calculate. So, this is x. If this is x 1.36 millimeter is equal to x into 0.34 into 10, 10 to the power minus 9 meter. So, by solving this we are getting it as 4 into 10 power 6 base pair. So, the number of base pair in a DNA of E. coli is 4 into 10 to the power of 6 base pair. So, the next topic will be central dogma. So, Francis Crick proposed the central dogma in molecular biology which states that genetic information flows in the direction of DNA from RNA to protein. So, DNA to DNA is generally called as replication, DNA to RNA is generally called as transcription and RNA to protein is called as translation. Sometimes in some viruses there are and there is an enzyme present which is called as reverse transcriptase which can transcribe for 
that is which can convert RNA, which can transcribe RNA to DNA. So, that process is called as reverse transcription and then enzyme that is present is called as reverse transcriptase. So, this is seen only in some viruses. Apart from that, what is the central dogma? Information will flow in this direction from DNA to RNA, from RNA to protein. So, packaging of a double helix. So, we read about the structure of DNA, right? So, the DNA, if approximately, so if we are calculating the base pairs that are present in a DNA and we are calculating the length, it will come an approximate of 2.2 meter. So, it is the length is greater than the dimension of a typical nucleus itself, that is approximately 10 power minus 6 meter. So, how can this be? coil kept in such a compact nucleus that is through coiling. So, in some prokaryotes DNA since it is negatively charged. So, why DNA is negatively charged is because of the phosphoric acid that is present H3PO4 sorry H3PO4 minus. So, it is negatively charged. So, here what will happen is in prokaryotes the packaging is not proper since the nucleus is scattered and the, they will be wounded around a positively charged protein and that is generally called as nucleoid whereas in eukaryotic cell there are some proteins which are called as histone proteins. So, histone proteins are generally rich in basic amino acid residues such as lysine and arginine because both of them will carry a positively positive charges in their side chain. So, again histone proteins are positively charged proteins and you have to remember there are 5 types of histone proteins. One is H1, the second one is 2A, 2B, 3 and 4. So, H2A, H2B, H3 and H4. So, all these will form an octamer that is a structure of 8. Apart from this H1 protein all will form an octamer structure and you can see here how they are arranged. So, H1 will function as a backbone and H2A, 2B, 3 and 4 will be arranged in a stack of 2 like upper 4 will be present and at the bottom 4 will be present and these 8 are alone called as octamer and they are also called as new bodies. So, this is also an important thing to remember what are histone octamers, which protein so which molecules constitute histone octamer and they are also called as new bodies. So, again this DNA is wrapped around that histone and it is called as nucleosome. A nucleosome will typically contain 200 base pair of helix. From nucleotide and from nucleosome it will be forming as a solenoid. It will be like in more compact forming a solenoid. Then it will be forming a super solenoid. Then it will form chromatin and it will form chromosome. So, you can see different different nanometer. So, yes how this nucleosomes will appear? It will appear like beads on a string. So, you can see this is nucleosome and this is solenoid super solenoid, chromatin and finally chromosome. Again there are two types of chromatin which one will be highly coiled and the other one will be less coiled and this heterochromatin is the darker highly coiled one it will appear dark whereas hue chromatin will appear light. So, a typical nucleus some region of chromatin are loosely packed and referred to as hue chromatin. Chromatin that is more densely packed are called as heterochromatin. Euchromatin is said to be transcriptionally active chromatin whereas heterochromatin is inactive. So, this is transcriptionally inactive whereas this one is active. So, now we are going to discuss how DNA is acting as a genetic material. So, search for genetic material. So, even though discovery of nuclein by Mischer and the proposition for principles of inheritance by Mendel were almost at the same time. But DNA act as a genetic material took long to be discovered and proven. So, the quest to determine mechanism for genetic inheritance had reached the molecular level now. So, many people propose many experiment and the first one will be the transforming principle which was produced by Frederick Griffith. So, in 1928 Frederick Griffith worked with two different strains of pneumonia one is S2 and the other one is R3. So, yes here is that is smooth will produce smooth colonies whereas the rough will produce rough colonies whereas the smooth colonies 
will be a virulent form that is they have the ability to kill the mice by causing pneumonia and this is non-virulent that is it, it does not harm the mice. So what Frederick Griffith did was he took rough strain that is non-virulent R strain he injected into a mice and the mice survived whereas when he took smooth strain he injected into a mice and the mice died. So he heat killed the smooth strain he is taking some S strain and he is heat killing that and injecting into a mice mice the mouse is surviving whereas he is mixing both the heat killed H strain and R strain and injecting into the mice and the mice is dying. So what did he conclude from this was he concluded that something is present in this H strain is has the capacity to transform the R strain into virulent one and that is what they are telling and this is not a this is S3 and this is R2. We will be learning this in second experiment. So, it is easy uh, important for you to remember. Smooth is also called as S3 and rough is also called as R2. So, what is the conclusion? You have to just remember the experiment name of the person who conducted and the conclusion. So, he concluded that something is present which is which has the ability to transform cell. However, he did not explain the biochemical nature of the particle that is present there. So, again biochemical characterization was done by three people McCarthy, McLeod and Oswald Avery. So, what they did is they cultured three different that is uh, strains in th three different culture plates and what they did was they added three enzymes to that. So, for the with the first one they added protease, for the second one they added ribonuclease that is RNAs that is enzymes which has the capacity to degrade RNA and to the third one they added DNAs. So, now what they did is they heat killed all these strains and now they are adding R2 strain to all these things. So, they are checking if it is having the ability to transform. For example, this uh, for uh, this is treated with the first filtrate is treated with protease that is protein degrading enzyme, second one is RNAs and third one is DNAs and now what they are doing is again they are heat killing it adding the R2 strain and they are checking for transformation by injecting into mice. So what is happening is here the mice is dying and here also the mice died and to surprise here the mice survived and here the mice did not die and they concluded that this DNA is only having the ability to transform and not RNA and protein. So, yes, so who did this? Oswald Avery, Colin McLeod and McLean McCarthy. So, they did this in the year 1933 to 1934. So, protein uh, treated filtrate did convert S3 strain to R2. Similarly, RNA treated filtrate also converted whereas DNA treated filtrate did not convert. So, they concluded that DNA is acting as genetic material. However, Hershey and Chase experiment is only taken as a univocal proof for these DNA is a genetic material and this is a very important experiment you have to learn this with the diagram. So, they work with bacteriophages that is virus which has the ability to infect bacteria what they did was they grew these viruses that is bacteriophage in some radioactive label medium that is S35 that is sulfur 35 and phosphorus 32. Again what they did was they infected these viruses into E. coli. So, they used E. coli and bacteriophage. So, first process is infection, second process is blending for removing all these viral code and third process is they are doing centrifugation for what to make the nucleus settle down and to remove all the cellular contents. So, when they are doing that what was detected is phosphorus was detected in the pellet whereas sulfur was detected only in supernatant and from this we can conclude that the phosphorus is present in the DNA. So, since this medium is having P32 this phosphorus is being incorporated into the genetic material and it is being passed down whereas sulfur is found only in the protein coat and it is not detected in the cells. So, yes what they use is they used bacteriophages. So, they use radioactive material viruses grown in the presence of radioactive phosphorus contain radioactive DNA viruses grown in radioactive sulfur contain 
radioactive protein but not radioactive DNA and this experiment is again very 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 important. This indicates that protein did not enter the bacteria from the virus. DNA is therefore the genetic material that is passed on from the virus to the bacteria. So, we know that not only DNA but even RNA act as genetic material in some virus example will be TMV tobacco mosaic virus, QB bacteriophage etc. Then why DNA is called as a predominant genetic material? So, for that we should know the characters of a genetic material. So, characters nothing but it should be able to generate a replica. It should be chemically and structurally stable. So, now you can remember why I have circled those structure when, when I was explaining about the structure of DNA and RNA. It should provide a scope for slow changes that is mutation and it should not be highly reactive that is chemically and structurally it should be stable. It should be able to express itself in the form of Mendelian character that is passed on from generation to generation. So, now the question is, is RNA not fulfilling this criteria? So, let us see DNA versus RNA. So, as I said, all the differences you can see here. So, this thiamine and uracil again, this site will be reactive. So, again here, this site will also be reactive making RNA highly reactive substance and not a stable one. Again, what are the differences? This is a double standard one and this is a single standard one. So, what I have told is given here the 2 dash hydroxyl group present at every nucleotide in RNA makes it a reactive group. Also, RNA act as a catalyst we will be seeing that in upcoming classes. DNA is chemically less stable and reactive than RNA among two nucleic acid DNA act as a better genetic material. So, yes that is what just comparing between both which can act as a preferable and more stable genetic material is DNA than RNA. So, now let us just discussing about few things about RNA and we will move to replication. So, RNA was the first genetic material if you have studied about evolution you will know that only after that slow changes DNA came into existence. So, RNA is also used as a catalyst. So, there are some important biochemical reaction in living system that are ca catalyzed by RNA catalyst and not an protein. So, but RNA being a catalyst was highly reactive and unstable. Therefore, DNA evolved from RNA with chemical modification to make it more stable. DNA being double standard and having complementary stand further restricts by evolving a process of repair. So, next we will be discussing in detail about replication and before we go on to replication we must know in what method or in what scheme the DNA is synthesized. The scheme, so while proposing double helical structure Watson and Crick immediately proposed a scheme for DNA replication. So, what is this is the scheme suggested that two strands would separate and act as a template for the synthesis of new complementary strand and this is called as semi conservative mode of DNA replication. The other two models or ideas which were put, put forth along with conser semi conservative model is conservative and dispersive. So, conservative is nothing but one daughter strand one daughter DNA will exactly look like the parent whereas the other will be new whereas dispersive is the parent DNA will break into fragment, frag fragments and daughter strands will be synthesized. But this semi conservative mode of DNA replication is accepted because it has an experimental proof which was put forth by Messelsen and Stahl in the year 1958. Messelsen and Stahl experiment is also again an very important thing for you to remember. Here they, they performed the experiment with E. coli using heavy isotope of nitrogen like Hershey and Chase they are not using radioactive isotope they are using only heavy isotope of nitrogen. So, in what way they are using is using NH4Cl that is ammonium chloride this one is important and how this heavy nitrogen is will be differentiatable from the normal nitrogen is through a density gradient centrifugation using in a cesium chloride medium. So, again this cesium chloride is also very important density gradient centrifugation is important this NH4Cl is also important they grew E. coli in a medium containing
heavy isotope of nitrogen as a result what happens this heavy isotope of nitrogen is getting incorporated into the DNA of the E. coli. So again what they are doing they are transferring it into normal medium and they are do the various samples were separated independently on cesium chloride gradients to measure the densities of DNA. What they are doing is first they are growing and they are taking a centrifugation. So as I said this is an heavy isotope of nitrogen it will form a band in the lower part or it will be settling down when compared to others. So as we said it is a semi conservative mode of replication after transferring it into a normal medium. What is happening is again after the first replication cycle what they got was they got a den DNA of intermediate density that is it is an hybrid DNA which is containing both N14 and N15 and after continuous replication cycle 2 and cycle 3 they saw that this N15 or the hybrid DNA concentration concentration is constantly decreasing the normal N14 DNA will give a light band on the top so with this they were able to differentiate so this DNA will contain only N14 this will contain N14 as well as N15 whereas this will contain only N15. So through this they were able to differentiate and they were able to tell that DNA replicates semi conservatively. This was performed by Meselsen and Stahl. So very similar experiment involving the use of radioactive thymidine to detect the distribution of newly synthesized DNA in chromosome were performed on faba beans. So faba beans plant by Taylor and his colleagues in the year 1958 and those experiments also proved that DNA in the chromosomes also replicates semi conservatively. So this is density gradient centrifugation and you can see how heavy hybrid DNA and light DNA are settling in this centrifugation gradient. So now we are going to discuss about DNA replication. So before discussing about the DNA replication process we are going to discuss about the steps involved in or the enzymes involved in the DNA replication. So again whatever is given in your textbook now it is for E. coli that is prokaryotic cell and not the eukaryotic cell. So generally origin of replication has to be recognized and that is done by DNA A protein and unwinding of double helix is done by helicase and stabilization of unknown strands are done by single standard binding protein and removal of super positive coil is done by the enzyme topoisomerase or DNA gyrase. Again synthesis of RNA primers is done by primase and synthesis of DNA. There are two strands I will be explaining you that both leading and lagging strands. The nucleotides are added by DNA polymerase 3 and those RNA primers are removed by polymerase 1 and the replacement of RNA with DNA is also done by polymerase 1 and the Okazaki fragments which I will be telling you are joined by DNA ligase and this is an energy consuming process and requires energy. So let us move on to the steps of DNA replication for example we are having two strands. So I am just give one strand of DNA I am just giving this for understanding. So which is going to unwind this strand is the helicase. So this helicase is going to unwind the strand and this structure is generally called as a replication fork. The entire DNA molecule as you know is very large and cannot be unwind in one stretch itself right. So it is unwinded at the helix particular helix where it is going to replicate and it will replicate open replicate open and replicate it will be continuing in that process and this is called as a the open structure is called as a replication fork. So here what is going to happen this helicase has opened this. So what we said some proteins which are going to bind will stabilize the structure I will just draw proteins here which are single standard binding proteins are SSP. Since DNA is a highly coiled structure there is someone, someone's need who will remove the coil. So he is called as topoisomerase removing the coils. So we know that DNA runs in anti parallel direction so let us put the polarity of each strand. So now what is going to happen? the synthesis is going to begin. So before synthesis we want someone to initiate the synthesis and that is done that is an RNA primer which is done by the enzyme primase. So primase is producing RNA primer. 
So after that DNA polymerase 3, I will just write polymerase 3 is going to add the nucleotide. So we said about the leading strand, right? So this is called the leading strand. The leading strand will be synthesized in the direction of 3 dash to 5 dash because polymerase cannot act continuously in the direction of 5 dash to 3 dash and it is going to synthesize in this way. So this is 5 dash to 3 dash. So what is the direction of leading strand is 5 dash to 3 dash it will be synthesized in complementary with the 3 dash to 5 dash polarity. So again whereas in 5 dash to 3 dash what is going to happen is small stretch of DNA is going to be synthesized many primers are going to be there and polymerase will add small small stretches of DNA. This smaller fragments of DNA are called as Okazaki fragments. So let me also draw it here so that it will make you clear we did leading strand I will just add, draw the lagging strand here. So now who is going to remove all the RNA primers it is the polymerase 1 DNA polymerase 1 I will just put polymerase 1 here and after removing primers what is going to happen these should be joined together right. So that joining is done by DNA ligase. So this joining is done by DNA ligase and apart from removing polymer, removing polymers this will also polymerase 1 also has the ability of filling this gap and that is joined by DNA ligase. So for there is also an enzyme called DNA polymerase 2 which will do proofreading activity that is if any strands is mismatched it will do the proofreading activity. So you can see this is the DNA replication. So yes, the main enzyme is referred to as DNA dependent DNA polymerase since it uses a DNA template to catalyze the polymerization of deoxynucleotide. These enzymes are highly efficient enzymes as they have to catalyze polymerization of large number of nucleotide in a very short time. So in E. coli 4.6 into 10 power 6 base pairs complete the process of replication within 38 minutes so that the speed of the polymerase enzyme will be 2000 base pairs per second. So they have to catalyze the reaction with the high degree of accuracy also as we have studied about mutation any small change will also result in a very big mistake. So in terms of energy also it is a very expensive process. So here deoxy ribonucleoside triphosphate serves as a dual purpose. In addition to acting as substances for complementary nucleotide they also provide energy for polymerization reaction and this is a very important line to remember. They also act as a substance for adding the complementary base pair they also provide energy. In addition to DNA dependent DNA polymerase many additional enzyme are also required for replication which we have already discussed. So for long DNA molecules as I, as I said two strands of DNA cannot be separated throughout the entire length at one stretch itself. So the replication occurs within a small opening of DNA helix and that is called as replication fork and they will be asking you a question like explain the events that occur in the replication fork. So you should be able to answer. So you can see that DNA dependent DNA poly polymerases catalyze polymerization only in one direction that is 5 dash to 3 dash and it cannot act continuously in 3 dash to 5 dash direction. So this creates some additional complications. So what is going to do, who is going to help here? It is going to be DNA polymerase 1 and DNA ligase who are going to join the Okazaki fragments and DNA polymerase 1 is going to fill the gap and also remove the primers that are present. DNA polymerases on their own cannot initiate the process of replication as we have already know a primer is required for initiation so which is done by the enzyme primase. So the primer is later removed. So next also the replication does not initiate randomly at any place of DNA. So one place which is called as origin of replication or it is also called as ORI. There is a definite region in E. coli where this replication will originate and that is also called as ORI C or ORI just ORI. 
So not every detail of replication is understood well. In eukaryotes when the replication take place it will take place at the S phase of cell cycle. So the replication of DNA and cell, div cell division cycle should be highly coordinated. A failure in cell division after DNA replication will only result in polyploidy. So what you have to practice is you have to practice sex link diseases, inheritance pattern, then structure of DNA and DNA replication along with diagrams. Diagrams are, diagrams are also very important part to concentrate. So with this we are closing this class and in next class we will be discussing about the continuation of this chapter. So what did we discuss today? We discussed about Mendelian disorders, chromosomal disorders. We have also discussed about DNA as genetic material, structure of DNA and we added to that we also discussed what are the experimental proofs proving DNA is the genetic material, then semi-conservative mode of replication and DNA replication in detail. Followed by this in next class we will see about transcription, genetic code and translation. So thank you students. See you next class and before I leave it's time for you schedule prepare and score thank you bye bye for more queries please contact buddy on 98408 44987 or visit buddy.life